Hello and welcome to TidyX episode 41. All right, so we've got a special treat for y'all and I'm sure you can see it to my upper left here. But TidyX is a screencast where we go through and explain how our code works. My name is Ellis Hughes. You can find me on Twitter at, at Ellis underscore Hughes. And I'm Patrick Ward. You can find me on Twitter at, at OSP Patrick. And you can find the screencast on Twitter at, at Tidy underscore explained. Or you can hit us up on Gmail, uh, tidy.explained at gmail.com. And we have a special guest today. We've had three special guests so far. This one, we have three firsts. Um, so we've had three guests, and today we have three firsts. We have first woman, first person in sport, which we, we do a sports screencast, and we this is the first person we had in sport, which is amazing. So we're breaking ground there. And then first international interview coming to us from Australia. We have uh, Alice Sweeting. Hey guys, thanks so much for having me. And yeah, thanks for having me all the way from Melbourne, Australia. Yeah, we're super yeah. thrilled that we were able to, to make this work across all the time zones uh, <laughs> and get all this going. Uh, but yeah, so we reached out to Alice, we're like, hey Alice, do you wanna, you wanna be on our screencast? And she kindly said yes. Uh, so then we asked her, okay, one more thing. Would you provide us some code for us to go through? And she said yes as well. So we're very lucky we get to go through some code that Alice wrote and explain how it all works. So let me bring this over. All righty. And so now we've got our code here. Let me share the screen so they can see it as well. Uh, share, share. All righty. Y'all can see the screen now, right? Uh, now. Oh, right. Yes. Yeah. I'll zoom in a little bit so that it's a little bit clearer for everybody, including the folks that are watching this. But all right, so this is a script that Alice wrote. So we're super pumped to go through this. Alice, do you want to take first crack? Sure. So thanks for having me on. Um, and this script and this data is, I think, another first for your show as well. It's about netball. Yes. So a sport that some of your viewers may or may not be familiar with. Um, it's a pretty big sport here in Australia and in the UK and in New Zealand as well. So um, hopefully one day it makes the Olympics, but I think we have to for hold sure. out for a while <laughs> <laughs> until then. <laughs> There's a high level for those who don't know netball, right? Sort of basketball, sort of. Sort of handball. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, um, handball, that's a good, yeah, that's a good. Mm -hmm. good yeah, basketball handball. Basketball without a backboard. <laughs> <laughs> That's, yeah yeah and position seven positions in the court not five and you can um only move around the court in specific areas according to your position and in netball only two positions can score so a goal attack and a goal shooter mm -hmm. um so here in this script we'll work with some netball data so first off from from line three to six there, we're loading some packages. So I'm sure um, these are some packages that your viewers may be familiar with, but we've got the tidyverse, GG dark, GG text, and catplot. Yes. Um, and here from line eight, all the way through until line 10, um, I'm kind of naming some colors here. So these are colors that correspond to teams that play in the Suncorp Super Netball um series some some cop super super netball league so um these teams kind of each have obviously different colors and i've tried to make the colors here in the plots um color vision deficient friendly so um the two teams that we'll be working with today are magpies and giants um so you can see those highlighted there yeah so perfect there are these last two at the end here yeah, always making your uh, colors color colorblind friendly are always incredibly important to make sure that all people can uh, when they're when you're looking at the plots are seeing what you're trying to get everyone to see. Otherwise, you know, kind of falls yeah. flat a little bit for for everyone. Yeah, I actually worked with a coach who um, was colorblind and couldn't see red and green. And one of the first plots I did when working with him, I didn't know that he was colorblind, but I did um, a green for winning and a red for losing. And I presented uh, uh. a plot to him and he was like, oh, what am I looking at here? So ever since that day, I've been like, I need to put color. At least he told you right away. I had worked for a coach that was also colorblind with red and green was, was a trouble color, you know, trouble colors for him. And he let me go like two weeks of presentations before finally he was like, you keep telling me there's like red dots up there. I gotta tell you, I'm colorblind. I can't see it. I'm like, well, why didn't you tell me on day one? Like, why did we go this long? I can you know? easily correct this. We, we, yeah. I, I have a way to make sure that you can understand what I'm talking about. 
<laughs> kind of weird. <laughs> I mean, you know, not all, not all people want to share that, I guess. Uh, yeah. So yeah. it looks like here we're loading in a bunch of different data sets. Uh, some we have yeah. locally, others are from a URL. Yeah, so the two local files um, correspond to some rolling substitutes and scoring. So rolling substitutes is a new rule that was brought in this year to Suncorp Super Netball. And what the rolling sub rule means is that um, players can change on and off the court freely. So there's no uh, limit or no cap on how many times they can come on and off the court. And um, traditionally in netball, you would have to call time or only make a change at quarter time or half time. So um, coaches were kind of limited in how many interchange or how many rotations they can make with their team. Whereas now it's unlimited uh, and players essentially don't need to fake an injury to come off the court and put someone else on the court. <laughs> so that first data set on line 13 there is um, that rolling substitute data. And then on line 14 is scoring data. So this is um, another new rule in, in Suncorp Super Netball this year. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So we can see we've got goal, two-point goal, miss, two-point miss. And that's because there was a new rule brought in this season uh, where goal scored from just outside or just near the, the edge of the goal circle, um, I think to it two meters into the goal circle. It was a painted kind of area on the court. Um, goals that were kind of shot from within that zone were worth two points. Mm -hmm. um, and this rule was only, to kind of make it even more interesting, was only um, kind of in play in the last five minutes of every quarter. So you couldn't shoot a two-point goal, um, mm -hmm. you know, one minute into the first quarter, for example. <laughs> <laughs> only <laughs> Is That's there a uh, strategy <laughs> <laughs> for the, the data here? You have a, a CSV, but is there like a just like a general netball website where any of the viewers who maybe are interested in doing some public work in netball could scrape data? Yeah, great, great question, Pat. So, um there is it's called Champion Data. So, I can even pop the URL, maybe I can pop it somewhere. Um, oh, yeah. We could probably put it yeah. on our YouTube. Yeah, we, we already we put that into yeah. the description. Uh, yeah. What was the URL again? Uh, it's championstats.netball. Hold on. Let me bring it up on my own machine. Uh, so the correct URL is mc.championdata.com forward slash super underscore netball. Cool. Sweet. I got it here. So here we go. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's it. Yeah. yeah. So people can find more uh, more information about the sport here, get some data. Yeah, um, there's also the Super Netball R package as well, which um, will help kind of scrape a lot of that data uh, in for you automatically. So um, if, yeah, you're an R user, check out the Super Netball R package as well. Um, you'll have to kind of get that from GitHub as well. It's not on CRAN yet. Um, yeah, we'll provide a link. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. So uh, line 16 there. So um, this is uh, this code corresponding to squad lists. So essentially players who um, play for each of the teams that I mentioned above um, and their names. So this is um, part of uh, work done by Aaron Fox, who's a researcher at Deakin University, um, who works a lot and researches a lot in netball. Um, and he's put a lot of publicly available work out there in netball. So as I was saying before, he um, he is really interested in kind of plus minus and kind of how teams are going and some win probabilities as well. So check out his work too. Here I've just read in, um, thanks to Aaron, he's kindly made his work publicly available. I've read in the squad list data so that I can easily marry up the scoring data. Um, because if you look in the scoring data set, yeah, that's the squad list. If you look in scoring, you'll see that there isn't um, a team column. So mm -hmm. um, kind of as a bit of a nipple nuffy, I, I know which players play for which teams. Um, but to make it a lot easier for, for the whole league, um, Aaron has a really good data set where he's got, you know, every player and, and who they play for. Um, so, yeah, there we go. We're doing left join. So we're kind of merging those two data sets together um, on line 22 there. So now we've got... You know, our players playing for the correct teams. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yep. Yeah. <laughs> we have to manually curate that. Yep. Yeah. Anything that makes 
uh, life a little bit easier, hey? So on line 25, we're then in the scoring data set. Now, as I mentioned before, um, it's goals before the 10 minute mark are worth one goal, irrespective of where the shooter shoots the ball from. But after the 10 minute mark, goals within that kind of, let's just say that red zone of the goal circle are worth two. So um, I've just kind of done a, a bit of a mutate there and using case when. Um, I used to use nested if else statements. I don't know if anyone else did that, but yep, that case when is sure. oh, makes life so much easier using case when. A lot easier. To <laughs> You don't have to follow the logic tree down so much. You're like, okay, it's this, it's then this. It makes it so much easier. You should always be using case ones. Yeah. yeah. Um, ironically, I have a UFL statement on the next line. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but this is like within, within a, uh, a section here, so it makes sense. <laughs> Sometimes it's, yeah, you kind of, it's like, slipping into a pair of comfortable pajamas, right? Yes. You kind of go back to something that works and you're really familiar <laughs> with and comfortable with. Exactly. So line 31 there, I'm just doing a cumulative score. So adding in um, a new column for margin um, and I've chosen the Giants. So when the Giants are hit, their score will be positive. When they're behind, their score will be negative. Um, and obviously for magpies, it would be the inverse. The, the interesting thing here about line 31 is that you are – using base R. So actually, <laughs> like, and it's, I, I do this sometimes too, but uh, walk through using that with function to then apply the cumulative score for people, because it's not something that I don't think we've- We've not covered this before. I mean, I use it a lot, but I don't think we've done it. We, ch we tend to do everything in tidyverse on the screencast. So can you walk through how you, how you did that? Sure. So um, I, when I started letting R, I started in base R. I didn't really know or come across the tidyverse until kind of much later in my PhD when I was a bit more familiar with R. So there are some things that, yeah, I kind of lapse in. I don't want to say into old habits or bad habits, but lapse back into base R. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for sure. So there is just simply saying, um, you know, create a new column in the scoring data um, set with the scoring data set and then yeah. create like a cumulative function. So when the giants, when the team is the giants, um, make it positive when it's not, make it negative. Yeah. Um, Did he live scoring from there? I don't know. I'm trying to think of how you would do that in the tidyverse. I guess a kind of a case when. Yeah. Or, well, you're only, you're only doing it for the Giants. I guess you could do it for every team as just a group by and then filter out the Giants. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have to think about yeah, this. Yeah, that's probably how I would how I would do it. Either that or I would do, um, I'd probably do Q sum, Q sum score brackets team equals equals giants. And then it would just do it for that team, I guess. Ah, uh, yeah. That That's probably how I, I would do it. Ellis probably, do... probably has a much more clever way than I do. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm would, a hack. I would just basically I'm, break I'm this hack. down in two pieces. <laughs> is my first instinct. So you do like this. Score, score. I'm sorry, I know I'm not capitalizing correctly, but this would be my first instinct. And then do margin. Was, yeah. yeah, already um, that looks a lot more elegant. Yeah. Uh, well, it, it does it. It took him you know, whatever, <laughs> six lines, and you yeah, did yours. And did much I mean, listen, I, I'm. I'm gonna. I'm not gonna give him the benefit of the doubt. What he did to your single line of code up there was stretch it out into four. But yeah. really, you did one line. Of code and yeah, I mean, I all, I all I did was take your pieces and break it out so it works. In my way. I know how to do it. So, no, this is this is a great thing that more people. I wish more people knew. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Alrighty. So. so line 37, and again, this would maybe uh, be kind of slipping back into that comfortable pair of PJs again, but um, working with time and dates, uh, you know, is great. Like the Lubra date package makes things so much easier working with dates and time. Here, I just wanted everything on the x-axis to be as a, as a numeric because I wanted to plot some contextual information that we'll get to shortly. Mm -hmm. um, and I think when you're working across, you'll notice that the time format is a little bit different in the two data sets as well. So um, it's pro there's probably a, a far more elegant um, kind of tidier way maybe of doing it. But 
And I wrote there, clunky and maybe a bit funky. <laughs> <laughs> but it works. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think, like, because because we're not working with dates here, yes, we're working with time, I just found it a lot easier to do this. So here, yeah, I've kind of done a really long winter way of, of making um, that timestamp data into numeric format. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a really clever, I've actually not seen this done before. This is really clever to convert it into a format that when you can just call as numeric on it and it's automatically going to be into a nice format for, for as numeric <laughs> to convert this character value into a numeric value. So this is pretty cool. Can, can we run oh, yeah. that and then um, run the, the head of the scoring data frame so we can look at timestamp yeah. and time kind of next to each other, see what it looks like? Uh, okay, so there you go. I think I'm over. Yeah, you. Oh, you uh, I, uh, yeah, yeah. Time sure. and timestamp. Yeah, so time is obviously as a character, and again, like I mean, some people, it might not be the the best way to do it, but um, I just find it a bit easier. No, um, no. And it, again, it could be just something, you know, one of those things that you get familiar with, right? Mm -hmm. And then you start kind of working in that way. Exactly. Um, so then this next. Oh, so line, yeah, line 40. So from 40 until what, 44 there. And um, within that scoring data set, we're now going to create another column called match time. So um, obviously, data was time stamped within each quarter. And rather than creating a plot that was faceted by quarter, I wanted to kind of create time as cumulative, you know, across like a the total time period across the whole game, across the whole match, because I just want one consistent solid x-axis. So um, all I've done there is netball quarters go for 15 minutes. So I've just added 15 minutes on to that timestamp column. And again, because it was in numeric, it makes it a bit easier to do that. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're working with kind of the, I guess, a traditional time format, it would be easy too, right? Like Lubridate makes it so much easier. And is it hours, minutes, seconds, like the, the actual function the I'm thinking of? Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah, it makes it very easy to do. So yeah. um, another case win. I'm glad mm -hmm. I didn't use if else there either. <laughs> <laughs> Rolling sub. So this is an interesting data set because, um, as I mentioned, in netball, you can make changes at quarter time, at half time, or now we can make changes throughout the game. So rather than waiting until those specific time periods, players can move on and off the court um, as the game is going, so as the game's active. But this data um, is coded. Yeah, you can see it highlighted there. So see the zero zeros at the start of quarter four. That means that Matilda Garrett, for example, was playing goal defense in quarter three um, and she got subbed off the court during quarter time, three quarter time essentially. So she is no longer the goal defense. Instead, Jodie Ann Ward came on as goal defense mm -hmm. for Magpies. So I didn't want to include this data because it's kind of not really a rolling sub. It's It's a... It's a change, it's, it's an interchange, but it's not something that kind of happens during the game. So yeah. I wanted to include um, things that were happening within the game because I guess I kind of wanted to look at momentum or things that were happening during the game that might influence scoring or might impact scoring. Um, and there's a whole host of things out there that we know impacts uh, scoring, a team's scoring ability and, and opportunity to score. Um, so here I've just tried to drill into one thing and that's rolling subs. So. Um, from line 48 and 49 there, I've essentially eliminated uh, any changes that were made at the start of the quarter. So mm -hmm. any changes, zero, zero. So any zero. Time that there's a zero, zero, zero or an S. Yeah, bye -bye. we just cut that. And S just means from substitute bench. From sub substitute, bench. yeah. Because it's, uh, what is that? From, um, the column must be from and then two, I guess is. So yeah. Jody yeah. and Ward went from, she was a sub, she was sitting on the bench to goal defense. Goal defense, that's it. Yeah, so the GD and the GS that you can see on your screen there correspond to yeah. netball positions. Okay. So I guess S is kind of like the eighth netball position, let's think of it as a sub. Gotcha. Um, and here you use a similar uh, technique to your bow. Yeah, yeah. And again, from line 53 to just kind of making it um, cumulative across the game. And again, there's probably a better way to do this. Um, it's probably just me kind of maybe being a bit too explicit or um 
maybe clunky but funky. <laughs> I think it's a great way to, uh, to work through the data and then work through and make it into a format that you're comfortable with working in because that's really also yeah. what matters too is like how comfortable you feel with the data and presenting it in a way that is easy for you to understand and grok, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So here um, I wanted on line 60, I wanted to create a new data frame. And this is just purely for this plot that we'll go through um, soon. This is a really basic plot. Um, just adding in that context of when the super shot was in play. Now we know that it's in play for the last five minutes of every quarter. Um, so it starts at 10 minutes into the first quarter, ends 15 minute mark of that first quarter. Um, yeah, you can see there. So time start, time end, really simple data frame um, that I've created. Um, and later on <laughs> in the code, we'll get to a, another way that you could kind of add in that contextual information. But here we're just creating a really uh, basic plot with ggplot. I wouldn't normally kind of wrap, see how I've got ggplot and then the brackets and the plus. I, I wouldn't normally do that, but we've got data from different data frames. Um, so that's why I've kind of explicitly got data equals super shot. Um, on line 65, yeah, and data equals scoring on line 67. Mm -hmm. um, ideally, you would have everything in the one. I think it's kind of best to maybe pull everything within one data frame and try and plot from that. Mm -hmm. um, I guess what I'm showing here is how you can add different bits of information that might come from different data sources as well, which is a really common thing in sports science. You know, you might have tracking data and you might have skill data, so you might be needing to plot a player's velocity, for example, and then... Um, have that as your plot and then overlay things that happen during the game, like penalties or handballs or kicks in an Australian football context, passes in a netball context, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess here I just want to show how you could maybe kind of layer within GG plot. For sure. And that, that's um, a nice flexibility. I, we haven't done it a ton, um, but I do it a lot, actually, like you described, pulling um, different data sets. So I, I would do it like this. The, the only thing is that you just have to make sure that the x-axis is always the same. It, yeah. it could be a different name. For example, in the second one there, you have in the scoring data frame, it's called match time. And in mm -hmm. the super shot, it's called time start. But it doesn't matter. They're the same type of uh, uh, character or variable. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's actually like works really well and it shows a lot of the flexibility of ggplot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ggplot. It just... When I discovered that, again, I, when I learned uh, I was plotting in base plot and then I discovered ggplot and I think it just kind of opens a whole new world, right? Yeah, like yeah. the amount of things that you can plot mm -hmm. and you just, the creativity and the, the whole curiosity like that layering, you get from the data. Layering yeah. up your data and going, okay, here's the base information. Here's like what's going to appear everywhere. But really what I care about is the pieces of information I'm going to stack on top of it or add additional context to this. And so... It just makes it so incredibly flexible. So right here, it looks like you're taking a ggplot and adding a geom rect, which is going to draw a rectangle, correct? Yeah, um, I, this is something I use a little bit um, in like kind of my real job or my work, <laughs> um, where you might kind of add different things that are happening. So it might be a, a certain type of game style the team wants to play, for example. Um, it might be a different phase of play that's happening within a game. So I use geom rect a little bit to kind of add kind of more information to the background for plot. I think it's kind of useful rather than just having a, you know, one kind of gray panel or one kind of gray color as, as your background, you can add even more information into the plot by changing the background. Mm -hmm. So that's what I've done there with GM rect. And then on line 70, GM step is just kind of creating your score worm. Um, so stepping through the data, you can also use, it's not GM path. There's another GM that you can use. Yeah, now I've got to think of it. You, you could probably use Geom Line, no? Uh, no, it's maybe it is Path. Or, yeah, yeah maybe but Geom it does change it slightly. Geom Step, yeah. So I think Step is kind of, yeah, creating a step through. Whereas GM Line, maybe we can kind of have the play around with it after we do this basic plot. I'm pretty sure GM Line kind of, a GM path, sorry, kind of plots a straight line in between rather than stepping yeah, through. I think so. Oh, um, okay. that's that actually here is showing yeah. like the the jumps up and jumps down at yeah. yeah, which is more representative rather of the scoring that's happening. 
Yeah. yeah, yeah, rather than kind of showing it over time. So in a sport like netball where there's, you know, goals scored really quickly, um, GM step and you'll see kind of there's lots of steps happening. Um, so maybe GM path might be better suited. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Could be worth could be worth a go. Yeah. Um, feline. Okay, so I was adding in some rolling subs. So adding in that kind of players coming on and off the court, changing positions on line 71, 73 is a, a point. And 74 is a text, so kind of adding um, some textual information or text to that point, and then adding in our lovely Suncorp Super Netball colors. Boom. All right. So here we go. Here's that plot. <laughs> here you go. Yeah. So this looks, here, let me zoom so it like shows up nice. There we go. So we can see the geome step. There, there's the, it's, it's, it's the connecting the, 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 yeah, I don't know what geome line would do. I guess it, I, I can't draw recall. a straight line between here and here. I think. Yeah. Oh, sure. That's right. Yeah, that's what it would do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it looked more. So it kind of. Would, it yeah. wouldn't add in time. I think. I don't think. Like, whereas yes. GM yes. step shows the time taken to kind of for the next score, for example. Yeah. So, Correct. I think Correct. this is a great uh, way to show this. So. Cool. So what are the pink boxes telling us? So the pink box is telling us that's when the super shot is in place. So that's when goals are worth two points in that zone within the goal circle. Um, and you can see we've got silver and orange bars. So that corresponds to our team, orange being the giants, silver being the magpies. And we've got little labels within those points, which are the netball positions. So WD, wing defense, GS, goal shooter, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, cool. So it looks All like right. the magpies are really trying the, the strategy of throwing in a, a new uh, shooter here around the during the super super scoring periods yeah they like to change their goal shooter either during or just before that super shot period um and the main reason for that is their goal attack is the predominant uh goaler who puts up that super shot whereas the giants both of their goalers can soup can shoot a super shot so um when they're on you know goal attack and goal shooter when they're playing kind of throughout the quarter when it's normal, normal rules, um, <laughs> and goals are worth one point. Um, both of them can, can put shots up, but the Giants are pretty flexible too in that both of their shooters can shoot from the longer distance, whereas the Magpies, yeah, they had a clear strategy of giving it to their goal attack who could shoot from further out. Interesting. Um, and we're yeah. tracking the point margin here, so the difference between one team and the other. Which team is the positive margin and which team is the negative margin? So the positive mar margin is the Giants, and okay. that's why I think this is a, a basic plot because I think we can kind of make it a bit fancier and make it a bit ah, happier, yeah. adding well, a bit let's more. Make it, let's make it uh, happier. Yeah, let's, let's <laughs> make it more context. Let's see what a happier <laughs> plot looks like. Huh? So I think I wrote, make it <laughs> make fancy, it fancy so let's make it fancier. Yeah. <laughs> so line 79 there, we're just creating, um, again, another column called super shot, and we're just going to designate within the data set when the super shot is in play by a simple uh, case when or a if else, um, yes or no when it's in play. Gotcha. Run that. So that's now added. So now we know yep. whether it's super shot or not time. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so you yes. can see that. <laughs> which is kind of in our data set, it's corresponding by our two point goal, right? But we want to make that contextual information a bit more obvious when we create the plot. Mm -hmm. um, and then line 84 to 85, again, they're the same colors that we used above, but I've just added in yes or no f for the super shot. So we'll, we'll create a lovely bright pink when the super shot is in play and it'll be um, white when it's not. So now we'll create um, Kind of a similar figure to one that we did above. But again, we'll make it a bit fancier. So we'll use GM step on line 89. Um, line 90, I just added in some breaks. So kind of adding in when quarter one, two, three, and four ended yeah. um, rather mm -hmm. than having like the minutes in there. Like I think the minutes make sense maybe to someone very familiar with netball, but maybe someone who isn't as familiar with netball, it's probably going to be a bit more obvious when the quarters end. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, line looks, 92 just scaling yeah it looks like you're taking the negative six, negative six to six and now making it so uh vertical the the y-axis doesn't go negative visually to us yeah right now you're making it so it goes six four two zero two four six so oh, yeah, yeah. to the team it's not actually negative quote negative like for plotting purposes it is but 
visually, it's, what, like, yeah. it's the margin. What's the negative for one team is positive for the other. So you're just, you're creating like a mirror of the, uh, the axis. Yeah. Basically. Yeah, that's it. And the first time I created this plot, I actually left the negative in. And then I was like, oh, no, that doesn't make sense. Like, it's not negative, but my class are winning. Oh, yeah, <laughs> so I've kind yeah, of, yeah. like, under the hood, everything's kind of fine from a GG plot perspective. And then kind of, I guess, from a car color perspective, let's say, we're kind of adding some labels to make it, yeah, marriage rather than having, I don't know how you would do that, you know, kind of, um, in GG plot itself, right? Like you can't have something starting at six and six. No, I think you have to do, I think this is this is how you have to do it. Unless one of our viewers yeah. knows of a better way to do this, then please do comment and let us know. Cause I think a lot of people would find that incredibly valuable. Yeah, yeah. I definitely would. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> uh, here it looks like you're drawing a horizontal line at zero. So we have that reference, correct? Yeah. Throughout the entire plot. Um, is this the same point that we were using before with drawing the points for the, uh, subs, correct? Yes. So that's the rolling subs added in. Um, so kind of when they occur, so X match time. So the point in time when they occur throughout the match, um, and we've kind of explicitly declared when they will, or where they will sit on the X axis, oh, on the Y axis, sorry. Um, but we'll edit mm -hmm. that later yes uh adding in our colors and then when we get to our title this is using the gg text package which i think um is super cool because it almost eliminates the need for a legend mm -hmm. um and that will hopefully make sense when we show the plot eventually but yeah i think it, sometimes if you can add color in your title it makes the the plot legend a bit redundant i think yes. and it kind of gives you a bit more space to play with in your plot Mm -hmm. I think as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. that, that's so clever. Um, um, so, so adds a lot. And they're just the colors. Yeah, and the team names. I like using the dark theme, and then they're just kind of some modification, further modifications to the theme as well, which I'm sure your viewers will be familiar with. Exactly. And here we go. Ooh, Here's a happier plot. That. <laughs> that really like plot right there. So here, the, the pink here looks like that's the super shot time. Mm. Yeah, and we've got our peach or orange color for the Giants. So these are when rolling subs were made um, by the Giants team and then silver for the Magpies team. And you can see that both of those colors are in the title. So I think rather than having a legend down the bottom, you know, like Magpies and Giants with kind of the geo and point color that you would traditionally have, we've kind mm. of removed the need for that legend and now it's in the title. Yes. It's a nice um, plot. Yeah, real it's clean. So nice. In the same sort of information that we were looking at before, but now it's a lot cleaner, a lot uh, visually yeah. nicer awesome. to look at and understand. A bit more visually pleasing, but I think we can make it fancier again. Yeah. Right, <laughs> Even more fancy. Even more fancy. No. <laughs> look at I think so. All right. <laughs> and that's this line here that's going to add a good chunk of it. Or a good, a yeah, so here... It. So here, um, you notice rolling subs sat up the top of the plot, right? They were plotted... Um, at the same Y axis location, mm -hmm. even though they differed for their X. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess it kind of makes, I guess it helps you to compare when teams were making subs at the same time. But I think it would be nicer if we moved the magpies rolling subs down to the bottom um, mm -hmm. of the plot and kept the giants up the top. So there I've just declared, um, and I've done this manually and explicitly, obviously, but um, you know, when the team is giants, make it six. When it's magpies, make it negative six. Mm -hmm. There you go. Um, and then same same plot um, up until line yeah one three four and one three five. We just changed our y um, to be y equals y location. And then one thirty six. I've added in GM segment as well. I really like lollipop charts. Yes. Um, <laughs> super neat so where i can add them in I, I add them in um and here we're just adding kind of a that segment um coming away from that that zero uh or that kind of i guess draw mm -hmm. axis yeah um this looks great and then yeah it's the same again so let's build that all right so then this is the plot we've got so no not that one this one score plot yeah, yeah score plot 
printing the right mm. object I find usually helps when, you, <laughs> when you're trying <laughs> yeah. to do something. I feel a bit more explicit and wrote score plot down the bottom, so that's me. I, I like the, uh, I agree, the addition of the lollipop, um, the dashed line lollipop thing is, yeah, it really sets it where, you know, where the sub is taking place. Yes. Yeah, yeah and nicer. you can see giants. So if we look in the second, or really it's the third quarter, yeah, and giants change their goal shooter in this game, and I reckon that's when the momentum kind of really changed, right? So their goal shooter came on. They had a change in, um, in player and personnel. The player came on, and they kind of pulled ahead and really used a super shot to their advantage. So... Um, yeah, I think adding some contextual information to yeah. score plot, I guess, might help tell part of the story of what's happening in a game. Or you know, would this that... game have been in netball from netball circumstances? Would this have been a very competitive game? It looks like the point margin never was more than five for both teams. So, it was a close and competitive game, or are most of the margins in netball this close? Um, this was a close game. So most of the margins, yeah, like I think anything under five, six is considered pretty close. I mean, the grand final of the Suncorp Super Netball this year was kind of neck and neck almost the whole way. And then yeah. one team pulled ahead right yeah. at the end. I mean, you do get kind of a blowout. You can get teams that end up winning by like 10, 15. Oh. Sometimes yeah, even yeah. twenty with the, the addition of the super shot, um, but this was considered a close game, uh, and these were two teams that I I think were kind of fairly evenly matched at this point in the season as well. Okay, oh, cool. cool, very nice, nice. Alrighty, but we know there's one more piece to this, <laughs> so more. I think you're right. We can make it even fancier. So here I just wanted to show you how how you can add logos. So I think on that plot, um, looking closer at the plot, we can see who is the Giants and who is the Magpies, you know, based on the colour of, of the rolling subs there. But I think we can um, lay out on top of the actual plot, so kind of not adjust anything um, to the GG plot, kind of plotting uh, syntax that we have there, but we can add logos on top. And mm -hmm. I found this really useful, um, again, at work, when you're wanting to add an image over something or kind of put an arrow or, um, you know, really draw people's attention to something on a plot as a static plot. So mm -hmm. here um, I've pulled in the Giants and the Magpies logos, and you can see that on line 164 and 165. And then we've used Calplot um, to kind of create a GG draw, so a canvas. We're going to kind of add our score plot to that canvas, yeah, on line 169. And then on top of that plot, we're going to draw an image, and those images um, uh, the Giants logos and the Magpies or Giants and Magpies logos. Alrighty, so and you can play around with the X and Y location. That's where it get, does get a bit kind of clunky and a bit manual because I think you, and I haven't found a way to, to automate this very well at all. Um, and even with scaling, it, it is a bit manual and a bit cumbersome, but I think um, it does give you a bit more flexibility because you can kind of add or stick something on top of that GG plot. Right, and we'll give my computer a moment to deal with this. Apologies. I wonder if, um, Ellis, do you know if if uh, if you use inside of uh, ggplot, if you use the annotate function, can you put an image into annotate? Uh, or is it my first thought would to look at a gg image? A gg image. I don't mm -hmm. know whether. I, yeah, maybe. I don't yeah. know. That might be a thing to look into. Yeah. It is to. Oh, this is. But this this, is nice. this, this viz here. You know what would be cool is, uh, do you have, Ellis, do you still have the Netball website um, pulled up? Can we see that for a second? Uh, I think, right. yeah, what would be super <laughs> cool for whoever runs this website would be to, you know, like maybe give you some money to plop this cool <laughs> context of the game down at the bottom. It's already in the right colors, yeah, the black yeah. colors. It needs to be right on there because now they get the box score and then they can see how the game unfolded. Yeah, the game and you could make it interactive with like you roll over a player and maybe you see where they subbed in or where their shots were and stuff like that, you know? You yeah, or their players. opponent or kind yeah. of where they shot from, like hands yeah. over defense or not, all of those things. Yeah, I think adding in all that contextual information is super cool. And I think as a fan and, you know, someone interested in analytics, right? Like 
all that contextual information yeah. really helps us learn more about what's happening on the court or on the field. So, yeah, yeah I, I reckon it would be super neat. But that's yeah, awesome. I'm, I'm never we'll there. <laughs> Awesome. Well, this was a lot of fun to go through. And I think a lot of, we, we highlighted a lot of really cool skills that kind of blends the base, base R knowledge with tidyverse. Uh, Cause I, I think base R can sometimes be overlooked occasionally uh, with the power that it has. Cause I mean, there's a reason R is so popular and it's because there's a lot of things you can really do with R. So it's, it, I, I always appreciate seeing base R stuff mixed in with tidyverse the plots here are obviously, you know, really nice looking, um, and I enjoy enjoy doing this. So yeah, that's cool. Yeah, thank you for sharing your code. Uh, so now we're gonna, you know, just chat for a little bit, All right? You good with that? Sounds good. All right, so I will bring this up and I will stop sharing my screen so that you can see my face too. All right, here we go. Ah, there you are. So uh, I, would, I think our viewers would love to, you know, how did you get started in analytics? How did, where, where's the, your background? Uh, where did you, how did you get started with all this? Oh, my background. So I grew up, <laughs> I grew up, my sport originally growing up was horse riding and equestrian. So I had horses growing up and I wanted to kind of represent Australia in three day eventing and go to the Olympics. And um, my ultimate goal was to be a vet and to be an equine vet. So I wasn't, I love sport, but I wasn't, you know, a huge kind of sport fan growing up. I was more interested in horses and getting my hands dirty and all of that thing. Um, but yeah, I didn't get into vet science. And then I heard of a thing called sports science. And I was like, well, I like playing tennis and swimming and running. And it'd be kind of cool to know like how athletes get better and like what makes them get better and how people, you know, I was curious about the why and the how, why are some people better than others at different sports and how do people train to get better? So yeah, I did sports science as an undergraduate at Victoria University here in Melbourne and then did my honors degree um which is kind of like a year i guess kind of um okay like intensive year of research mm -hmm. um after undergrad and then started my phd and and that was with netball australia and the australian institute of sport and um it started out as a, a physiology project we're going to look at training and, and matches but from a physiology perspective um and then i was lucky enough to be supervised um, by Professor Stuart Morgan, who's at the Australian Institute of Sport. And he uh, was a performance analyst at the Victorian Institute of Sport, but had a background a bit different. Um, I think his, his PhD was in neuroscience originally, but he was really interested in analytics and he works heavily in the computer vision space. Um, and he, yeah, kind of introduced me to R and um, kind of, yeah, opened my eyes really to like, working with data and um, being able to look at how teams were forming patterns, things that were happening during games. Um, so I learned, uh, <laughs> he showed me how to install R and, and how to get it going. Um, and <laughs> I spent about a week working out how to import my data into R and being too scared to tell him that I couldn't work out how to do something so basic, right? Like in Excel, you double click on your file and it opens and it appears. <laughs> um, but it took me so long to, to work out how to get my data into R and how to visualize it. Um, yeah. But I was working with uh, tracking data in Netball. So we were looking at different types of movements that Netballers were doing. So changes of direction, accelerations, um, what types of velocities they were hitting. Although in netball, the court is obviously quite small and you're confined to where you can move on the court. So, mm -hmm. you know, you're not going to reach really high velocities like a lot of our field um, team sport athletes. But in netball, changes of direction, angle of attack are, are really important, like changing your position and kind of shifting a team around strategically. So, yeah, he kind of opened my eyes to um, analytics and the world of analytics and mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, it kind of started from there, I guess. And then I finished my PhD in late 2016 and was fortunate enough to start working with the Western Bulldogs who are an AFL team. Um, so they play Aussie rules and they have a strategic partnership with Victoria University. So um, as part of that strategic partnership, I got to be a research fellow and kind of keep working in the sports analytics space and supervising postgraduate students, PhD students, um, and working with Professor Sam Robertson as well. So he um, 
obviously your viewers might know him, but he's kind of a bit of a leader in the sports analytics space and sports science space. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, got to got to work every day with data and R and um, yeah, work in the whole kind of team sport analytics space. So that's what I've been doing since yeah, late 2016. So it's kind of been a real change from yeah, being a girl on a farm, <laughs> leading horses around, going to pony club, and <laughs> all of those things. It's <laughs> um, amazing. That's oh, pretty cool. So what, without um, you know, giving away the trade secrets, like what kind of uh, things, like what kind of problems would you be trying to solve for at the Western Bulldogs? Is it more like applied physiology training type problems? Is it more team tactics or talent identification problems or maybe all of the problems that, you know, is there, is there like, what kind of things would you be working on on a, on a kind of regular basis? I guess. Yeah. So training, um, evaluating training is, is one thing and evaluating it in terms of a physical perspective and then from a skill perspective. And um, I spoke a little bit about before about merging different data sources together. So um, for us, it's about knowing um, what types of drills to use during a training session and, and when to, to place those drills within a training session based on an athlete's physical output, but also based on their skilled output as well. So in an Australian football context, how many kicks and handballs they're getting. Um, and then added to that are the constraints within which those skilled actions occur. So um, is a player getting tackled? Do they have a lot of room to move? Is it kind of a bit of a closed drill where the emphasis is on kind of making the skilled action and, and improving their skilled action? Or is it a bit more open, a bit more game-like where they have to make a lot of decisions really quickly under a lot of pressure? It, and that might be physical pressure or perceived pressure. So, um, yeah, a lot of my role was kind of helping collect that skilled and physical data and kind of merging it into um, databases and helping to evaluate, yeah, what drills should be placed where within different training sessions at different times of the year. Um, and also working pretty closely with um, our coaches as well in terms of evaluating match performance. So looking at different phases of play during a game, um, looking at you know how many kind of skilled involvements a player might get during a game in different positions um, and kind of helping feed that information back and working probably a bit more generally as a sports scientist. So, you know, collecting, collecting data in not, not probably not so much in the gym, but before training, certainly about readiness to train. Um, and that could be through, you know, a, a questionnaire. So a player would fill in a wellness questionnaire when they arrive at training, um, collecting some um, adductor strength data on them. So kind of how ready they are from a groin, groin strength and adductor perspective, a physical perspective, mm -hmm. um, and helping to kind of transmit that information back to medical staff and coaching staff and high performance staff as well. So yeah, it was, um, yeah, already is a kind of a bit of a mixed bag of, of lollies of different skills and things that I do. Um, but yeah, I'm really lucky enough to work with some super talented people and athletes and, um, get to work in our most days and, um, yeah, really responsible for kind of handling that data and disseminating that data and helping people use data essentially. That's, that's yeah. all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. much. Yeah. Uh, how, yeah. Uh, what advice would you give to somebody that's looking to get into this field and looking to do the sort of work that you do and look to you as a, as a, you know, inspiration? What would, what would you, what advice would you give them? Ah, oh, it's always a tough question. I think, um, if you're interested in a sport and you like R or you like a programming language like Python, for example, um, and you're interested in a sport and you want to get into sports analytics, I think um, kind of showcasing your work publicly and um, whether that, that is in the form of a blog or a screencast like we're doing now, um, kind of putting some work out there, maybe also reproducing someone else's work. Like I think that can be super helpful as well. So say I put some code out and I publish it to GitHub and then someone goes and replicates and reproduces the work. Um, that's also really helpful too in terms of building your skill set and also helpful for the person who created that code and, um, um, you know, that repository and, and that data source to start with because it's you know, helping their work, ensuring that it's reproducible and replicable as well. Um, so I think, yeah, being in, if you're interested in a sport, interested in sports analytics, um, yeah, just ha have a go at playing with some data and, and visualising some data and, um, yeah, being curious about, 
data or curious about what happened, things that happen in sport, um, things that happen on the field that could be explained by statistics or by analytics or by pieces of information like we just showed before with the rolling subs. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think, I think, or, yeah, like, you know, there's so much out there at the moment, particularly with COVID, probably, I don't want to say a blessing of COVID, but something that has happened out of the pandemic um, has been the accessibility to conferences and kind of free things that are out there. So, um, yeah, kind of soak up bits of, of, you know, whether it might be a recorded lecture or a tutorial, a recorded presentation or a record, recorded conference. There are also good ways to get into the field as well by listening to people who, yeah, work in the space um, and reaching out to them, send them an email or drop them, you know, a DM on Twitter and um, <laughs> just, yeah, say, I'm interested in your work. What are things that are interesting to you or what do you find? Um, what are you curious about? Like, I think that's another way to kind of, um, you know, kind of get into the industry as well and, and get talking with someone because it is still a pretty small industry. Well, particularly here in Australia, it's, you know, it's still fairly small um, and it's hard to crack into and it's often hard to get started. <laughs> but I think by, yeah, kind of um, making use of, of the freely available data that is out there is a good stepping stone into the industry. P public work is really good. David Robinson in our interview also talked yeah. a bit about the value of doing public work. Seriously. I guess like one more question. One, one more question, I guess, would be, um, uh, you know, as you talked about public work, you originally, I think you still update your blog. Uh, our, our stats are sweet or sports <laughs> stats are sweet. Or something, something like that, if I recall. And, and uh, you, obviously you teach and you have students and you have PhD students and you do something with, um, is it, what is it, is it like Australian R for ladies or something like that. Uh, so I guess my question around that is as, as a teacher, as an educator, um, trying to put this stuff out to people and, and help them learn and upskill, like what, what's your advice for people that are um, kind of getting started and overwhelmed with like, wow, I, I mean, I don't know, like you, you took a week to figure out how to load your data. You know, like when I started, you know, I, took a week to figure out how to change my working directory you know not not all of us are not all of us are like tech geniuses like ellis where it's like oh this is the computer i built it and now i use r I <laughs> like what, what's kind of as, a, as, an as, yeah, as, as an educator kind of like um yeah what's the approach for like helping students begin you know even just start it yeah, another great question. So the blog originally, I originally started that because people were learning R and they were like, oh, how do I create this plot? How do I get started in ggplot? And I would get questions from peers who, you know, I was sharing an office with at, at Victoria University. We have a big office where pretty much all the PhD students in health and sports science sit, which is super cool because you get a lot of interesting conversations that are happening. But also, you, you know, you're trying to write your thesis and you're getting questions about how do I do this in GGplot? So I started creating a blog mainly to just share code. So if people wanted to replicate something, you know, there was some code there that they could use as a scaffold for their own work. Um, but I think, yeah, you mentioned Our Ladies as well. So Our Ladies Melbourne and Sydney, and I'm, I know there's chapters around the world and in the US as well, um, run meetups. So they occur on a monthly basis typically. Um, they've been virtually this year, which has been great because you can kind of dial in to different Our Ladies mm -hmm. meetups around the world. Um, and they're open to, to anyone who is interested in R as well. So it's not specifically a, a you know, a female or a woman thing. It's, it's, you know, anyone who has an interest in art, it's very welcoming. It's very supportive. Um, you get people turning up. So there's, you know, professors in statistics at a highly regarded university here in Melbourne who turn up and then someone who is very new to R and has never even downloaded mm -hmm. R Studio. So you get a wide range of participants, which I think is great because as an educator, it's sometimes it's hard to remember where you started and the difficulties that you found when you did start out um so there the one resource that i always mention for beginners um our ladies sydney have a fantastic online series called are you with me 
Um, and I'm sure we can we can put the link somewhere. Yes. But I think it's a really great resource for getting started because it's almost taking you through the steps that it sounds like we both <laughs> struggle <laughs> with at the start, which is really getting started. You know, how to import your data in, what what is R Studio? What are all these different windows and panes, and what what happens? <laughs> um, so that's a really great re resource. And yeah, I think. Um, come along to our Art Ladies Meetup. And if you're in Melbourne, come along to an Art Ladies Melbourne Meetup. Um, and I think there's more and more formal kind of offerings as well that are popping up in the sports science, sports analytics space. And and I'll plug out our new offering at Victoria University. So we have a new graduate certificate in sports, in data analytics for sports performance um, that's starting next year. And it's a graduate certificate. So it's six months. It's really 16 weeks. So we do four subjects over 16 weeks. Um, so four weeks per subject, which is pretty intense. Um, yeah. But I think, yeah, those kind of soaking up um, some formal education, if you can, and it, it might not be in the form of a, of a, you know, a long course. It could be in the form of attending a workshop or a meetup. Um, and yeah, just, just getting chatted to people, chatting to people. And I think one thing um, that really helped me when I started learning R was starting out with a data set that you're really familiar with and something that's of interest to you and a problem that's of interest to you. Like we know that there's a heap of data out there that we can use like cars and um, <laughs> the other one, the, the aeroplanes package with the, the landings. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> that's right. Palmer penguins is another pretty cool yeah, one. Like it's an animal based package. One, yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I think if you have a data set that's small and, and you know it pretty well and, um, you know, it, you're familiar with it in Excel and um, it, one starting point could be just trying to replicate something that you do in Excel. So mm -hmm. one thing I say to students all the time is a pivot table, for example, where you've got a data set and you're wanting to look up, I don't know, one athlete's mean across a period. So it might be, I don't know, mean mean strength on the left hand on the left leg, I don't know, or yeah. kicking efficiency on the left leg versus the right leg across time. Mm -hmm. Um something that means something to you and it's a problem that's really specific or kind of a, of interest to you, but yeah. it's a small enough data set that you can get started. It's not too clunky. It doesn't have um, some of these nuances that we spoke about before with dates and times and things, um, yep. something that's fairly clean and you can replicate um, something that, that you've done in Excel. So a pivot table, for example, and we know that using the tidyverse, it's so easy to calculate summary statistics in R and create a nice looking visual. So yeah, probably um, long winded answer, but I think <laughs> using, yeah, something yeah. that you're familiar that's with and seeking all yeah. the, all the, um, yeah, there's just so much cool material out there now. And I think people are so willing to share now as well. And I think that's something that makes the art community really special. And I really love about the art community. You know, people are, oh, I had this problem. Oh, I had this problem too. You know, you hear Hadley even say, oh, I still Google things. Like I still forget things. So I think yeah. it's reassuring, particularly yeah. for beginners. Yes. Yeah. We're, we're sure. all in this together. We're all, we all want to help each other become better, right? That's, yeah. that's why we do this. It's it's to, to meet uh, fellow R programmers and, you know, try to disseminate knowledge because we, we learned from, we stand on the shoulders of giants, right? Like we learn yeah. from other people. We didn't, we weren't born with this knowledge. I, we Google all the time. Right? Yeah. I, I, I don't, I don't think I could do my job without Google. <laughs> I'll stack over. Yeah. Uh, that's so helpful. Yes. So, I go for flow. I think people are aim it. <laughs> to post a question sometimes but the good thing about stack overflow that's actually a really good point because it makes you think about the question and the problem that you're having right and it yeah. makes you create a reproducible example that people yeah. need to create so i think stack overflow is is super useful too that's right yeah it, it's only uh stack overflow isn't always the best for like a total beginner because you can't just ask a question like you're like, wow, I'm going to need to learn some basic level of R just to ask a question on Stack Overflow because I have to be able to create a, some sort of fake data set, show them what I want, maybe show them how I'd like it to come out and what I've tried and what I'm getting so that they can, you know, point you, point you in the right direction somehow. But mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it, but it's good. I mean, it's, it's, there's a lot to learn there Super for sure. Source. Yeah. That's sweet. Uh, awesome. So I don't think I have any more questions. Pat, do you have more questions to, to ask? No, I I think yeah, that was great. We got a good we got a good plot. We went over some cool stuff. Uh, we learned about a new sport. 
Yeah. yeah. We had our first, our first international, our first person in sport, our first female. So happy. So happy you were able to join us. <laughs> It's a pretty full episode, so I think we're pretty good. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me, guys. And, yeah, I've learned so much from from your screencasts, and I regularly share them with the, the students and MPs who I work with. So oh, thanks so you. much for creating them. And, and the Shiny um, kind of series was so helpful as well. So thanks so much for Thank all your you. knowledge and sharing your knowledge. <laughs> it's our pleasure. Cool. Yeah, appreciate it. Uh, so with that, I guess we can call it. So we'll do our sign-offs now. So... Thank you all for joining us. My name is Ellis Hughes. You can find me on Twitter at, at Ellis underscore Hughes. And I'm Patrick Ward. You can find me on Twitter at, at OSP Patrick. And you can find Tidy X on Twitter at Tidy underscore explained. Or you can hit us up, tidy.gmail, tidy.explained at gmail.com. Uh, we love to get ideas and feedback and questions. And then our guest, you can find her on Twitter at... I think I'm at Alice Sweeting, so you think I'm, I'm, I'm pretty we'll, sure I am. We'll figure out where you're at and we'll put it in the show notes. <laughs> no, I, right, and GitHub right. as well. If, if anyone's interested in the code, I'm sure you'll share that so as we'll well. Share, we'll share a link for that as well. But thank you again so much for joining us and keep on exploring your world.